Hello, everybody. When uh, learning about total intravenous anesthesia, there are several useful skills to consider. I'm going to be focusing briefly on pharmacokinetic modeling using the software uh, designed by Dr. Steve Schaefer called StanPumpR.io. The URL is provided over here. And this is just a brief overview that I think gives you a sense of how you can use this to plan your total intravenous anesthesia cases so that you accomplish TIVA bar, where bar stands for blocking autonomic response, somewhat analogous to MAC bar with inhaled volatile anesthetic agents. So let's take a hypothetical patient who's a 50 year old man with normal renal function, 70 kilograms, and a relatively normal height. And the first thing we do is that we give him two milligrams per kilogram of propofol, 140 milligrams at time zero, eight o'clock in the morning at time zero. And you can see over there, a bolus of propofol is given. And um, I'm showing on this um, set of graphs, propofol, remifentanil, and fentanyl. At the moment, I've only given propofol. And you can see that the probability of an autonomic response like intubation with just this bolus dose of propofol rem remains relatively high at about 70%. So propofol alone is not going to cut the mustard. And if you want to block autonomic response, you need to combine propofol with other drugs such as opioids. So um, this is just zooming in on that particular graph, showing you a 150 milligram bolus dose of propofol with the probability of an autonomic response to stimulation such as intubation. Now let's take it further. And in addition to the 140 milligrams of propofol, we also give a 200 microgram um, dose of fentanyl, which is um, conveniently an ampule. It's almost three micrograms per kilogram, which would be 210 micrograms, but 200 is roughly three micrograms per kilogram. What you can see here is that with the combination of the propofol and fentanyl bolus, now you have a period of about 20 minutes during which the probability of an autonomic response is markedly decreased because of the, the, the interaction between these two drugs, propofol and fentanyl, which is what we would desire, and also shows why we often give an opioid um, when we give an induction agent prior to um, intubation with induction of anesthesia. Now imagine that in addition to the fentanyl at time zero, these are all at time zero, we also started an infusion of Remy fentanyl at 0.1 microgram per kilogram per minute. And by the way, these shaded areas are the target um, concentration of the, at the effect site that we would um, consider with the drug alone that we would like to accomplish for those drugs during intravenous anesthesia. So in, in the case of propofol, it's somewhere between about two and a half and four micrograms per milliliter. For fentanyl, for remifentanyl, something like one to two nanograms per milliliter. And for fentanyl, between about um, half and just over one nanogram per milliliter. Right, so now we've given all three drugs and you can see with an ongoing remifentanyl infusion and remifentanyl reaches a steady state pretty quickly after about um, half an hour and doesn't then accumulate, which make, makes it a very attractive drug because it's broken down by esterases. You can see that the probability of a response to a uh, a stimulus is now um, decreased for a much longer period of time, almost about 45 minutes. Now, in addition, we give another bolus dose of propofol at 50 milligrams at 30 minutes into the case. Um, and we start a propofol infusion also at time zero, right at the beginning at 120 micrograms per kilogram per minute. We achieve a couple of things in doing this. One, we give this bolus dose of propofol shortly before skin incision, because we want to create more assurance that there won't be an autonomic response to this big surgical stimulus that is predictable. And that by running the propofol at 120 micrograms per kilogram per minute, we stay at just, the, just below or just within the range of our target concentration of propofol at about two to four micrograms per milliliter. And you can see that we could probably do that for quite a long time before the propofol started to accumulate. 
If instead we had started the propofol infusion rate at about 200 micrograms per kilogram per minute, then you would have seen that we would be escalating above and going beyond the recommended target concentration within blood or the effect site for our propofol concentration. Now I've added to this some other maneuvers that we do, because let's assume that the case finishes at roughly uh, be somewhere between uh, um, um, 9.45 and, and, and uh, 10.15. Arbitrarily, I'm just saying that's somewhere where we finish because this is some uh, hypothetical case. Well, we've done a few things throughout the case. The first thing that we've done is we've started decreasing the propofol concentration throughout the case just to um, facilitate a more rapid wake up. So at about nine o'clock, we decrease the propofol from 120 to 100. What you will note is that this doesn't really markedly decrease your propofol drug concentration in terms of micrograms per milliliters. However, um, if you go to 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute, now you can see, and this is at about 930, that it does start to decrease your concentration. And I would start to be worried there about patient arousal, not just autonomic response. So if you're going to do this kind of strategy, it's probably important to antagonize neuromuscular blocking drugs like rocuronium. You do not want patients profoundly um, or being completely unable to move if you are trying to decrease hypnotic component of general anesthesia. So in my practice, I would um, consider antagonizing neuromuscular blocking drug at the point at which I did this. Certainly, I would antagonize neuromuscular blocking um, drug before I turned off the propofol, which in this case I'm doing at 10 o'clock. Now, let's say there is um, um, closure is going on and dressing is occurring, and then finally dressing is applied and all is done at 10.30. You can see there that if you turn off the Remy fentanyl at that time point, even though it was in the super therapeutic range, because it is broken down so reliably and so quickly, very quickly Remy fentanyl decreases. And you can also see that the patient uh, probability of response starts to increase. This is of autonomic response, but the patient could certainly wake up prior to be, there being an autonomic response where the patient opening their eyes, not having hypertension, not having tachycardia and being very comfortable. So the patient could theoretically wake up at about 10.45 and as they become more awake and, and as the Remy fentanyl starts to wear off, you could titrate in additional analgesic agents like hydromorphone or fentanyl or whichever agent was your preference. In this slide, I'm just showing you some potential EEG correlates of what's going on during the case. So when we gave these bolus doses of propofol, we actually might have a higher probability of EEG suppression, which might be what we're trying to achieve, actually have some brief periods of a electroencephalographic suppression to really minimize the chance of an autonomic response to stimulation. For the majority of the case, when our propofol is in this kind of band over here, um, together with the um, combination with the Remy fentanyl and the fentanyl at the beginning, we probably have a high probability of a delta spindle pattern on the EEG, a pattern very consistent with general anesthesia, especially with nice, slow, high amplitude rhythmic delta waves, um, phase amplitude coupled with alpha spindles. In a separate presentation, we'll look a bit more at the EEG features with total intravenous anesthesia. And then as we turn the propofol down and then off eventually, you start to get a high probability of high frequency EEG activity, for example, um, beta, um, beta waves above 20 hertz, which will be consistent with arousal and wakefulness. So this is, is useful and hopefully gives a good idea to you of how this pharmacokinetic software can be used to prepare you for a total anest intravenous anesthetic case that, that you might be doing in your practice. So um, thank you very much for uh, listening briefly to what I have to say, and I hope that this brief presentation was of some interest to you. Thank you.